give the new generation of microbiologists in South America and Latin America, and sometimes get a couple from North America and Europe, hope we we'll get more in the future. But this is an effort that has been going on for more than 10 years, and right now it's very rewarding to see how we have been able to build a network and that the environmental microbiology and particularly marine bi microbiology is uh, growing in South America, in Latin America, and as I mentioned to, to uh, people in the course, uh, it's very nice when you um, go to an international meeting and see some of our former students presenting and becoming uh, you know, real scientists in the real world. But this couldn't have happened if, without the generosity of the lectures, like the one we are going to have today, from people traveling from different parts of the world to be part of this initiative. Chile is far away from, you know, the northern, from North America and Europe, and still, every time we have had this course, we have always been able to get the best people to come here, both to teach in. Uh, Bichato and in Las Cruces ones, but also to attend this mini symposium. Uh, the idea with this mini symposium is to offer not only to the students of the course, but also to the campus. So here I see some, some of the faculty that are attending this, and some will probably join us later because they are other commitment, but also we know that some are following to the internet. So I, I want to thank uh, particularly uh, Kurt, of course, is the soul of the Ecodim. <coughs> and he has been with us all the time and inspiring in us in this effort to be a capacity building in this part of the world. Uh, I tell you that we have some plans with Kurt and he's, he has also started a similar initiative in Africa, in Namibia. So probably maybe some points in the future will also come for the Ecodim for from Africa. Uh, also we have Daniel here who has been four times with us. I know he's also doing efforts in Brazil and also in uh, Vietnam. So we are spreading all over the world and trying to inspire the new generation on this fascinating uh, world of microbes. So I, I, I don't want to say more than that except that uh, again to thank all the participants and I just briefly going to everybody of you has the uh, program, so you can um, see there that we have very exciting talks. And I'm looking forward to listening to our colleagues. Also, uh, for uh, for those of you that can join us, uh, especially the faculty, we have a barbecue this afternoon in Chato. We have we have to arrange some transport for from here and backward, so please get to Monica Sorondo if they want to join us there, and so also we want to know how much beer and wine we can buy. <laughs> <laughs> so please join us if you want to uh, keep uh, talking with the people that have come and joined us today. So without more than that, I, I want to introduce you. Oh, first, but it's not my duty, so. There is a tradition in this uh, Ecodine Symposium that the students introduce the speakers, so they can do an open and deeper. So, I please the students who uh, are going to introduce the first speaker. Dr. Norman Pace is a professor at our 
molecular, cellular, and um, developmental uh, biology at the University of, Col of Colorado. His work opened a new era in the microbiology when uh, we realized that the long fraction of the microbial community uh, could be not cultivated. From the land uh, to the sea, today we have a search in uh, drawing hypothesis, uh, discussion and ecology, evolution and understanding uh, the complexity of microbial um, world because this uh, is a achievement. So thanks uh, Dr. Harris for accepting to participate in this symposium and to to listen from you. <coughs> I think this made all of us who know about Carl Woese very sad because he changed the world of microbiology. What Carl Woese gave us was a way to think about microbial diversity that went beyond the traditional use of petri dishes, characterization of individual organisms. Woese didn't know it at the time, but the metric, the map, that he gave us of microbial, of biological diversity, also made possible for the first time to really go into the natural microbial world and learn something about that. The reason that this was a new thing was that before Carl Woese, in order to characterize microorganisms, they had to be cultured, cultivated, petri dishes and all that. And it turns out, it turned out that we couldn't culture very much of what was out there. But what Carl Woese gave us was a view of life's diversity based on sequences, gene sequences. That has nothing to do with characterization of organisms, and so it was then possible to go into the natural microbial world and isolate DNA, and from that DNA to determine sequences and thereby learn something about organisms in the natural microbial world for the first time. And that's the story that I'll tell you. We call this business of using sequences to study the natural world, it's called metagenomics. And I'll tell you about the beginnings of metagenomics, building on Carl Woese's understanding of microbial diversity. <coughs> 
Here's the outline that I'll use. I'll first tell you a little bit about what Carl Woese put in place, a scientific tree of life, a new biology for the 21st century, an entirely new way to think about biology. And I'll talk about Carl Woese's impact on the development of modern microbial ecology, metagenomics. And I'll talk, tell you about how this study of sequences in the environment has expanded dramatically our understanding of microbial diversity, and I'll give you the current state of the, the big tree of life. And finally, I'll talk about a, a public service message on behalf of Carl Woese. So when you go down to the shore in Concepcion or Dichato and pick up a little bit of green stuff and put it on a microscope slide and blow it up 200 power, this is something like what you'll see. Oh, you'll see some things that you can recognize, diatoms, for example. And Daniel Volo can tell us about these other sorts of things, maybe premnesiophytes. But when, when you look at this very long, you realize that most of what is in here, and you don't see it in this slide, are the little dots and squiggles and rods and so forth that are not really visible here, but far, far outnumber the large organisms. How to find out something about all of those little things. And as mentioned, traditionally, classically, it was necessary to culture organisms. But we can't culture much of what's out there. Of what you look, see in the microscope, you could perhaps culture 0.01% of what is in there. So you don't culture 99.99%, and that's most of what's out there. How to describe biological diversity? Well, it's long been known, of course, recognized by biologists, that the way to recognize, to organize what biology is, is to use the concept of phylogeny. That's about understanding how organisms are related to one another. In fact, even Darwin said our classifications will come to be, as far as they can be so made, genealogies. And that's what phylogenies are, are genealogies, relatedness patterns of different organisms. Now, people have been thinking about this problem for a long time. And still, much of the thought in our textbooks is based on this concept from Ernst Haeckel in 1866. So Ernst Haeckel had down at the bottom here his monera, and somehow they turned into plants and protists. This is microbial eukaryotes and animals. And of course, the monera persisted as bacteria, we would call them. 1866. That's pretty much where it stayed for the next century. And by the 1960s, it didn't change very much. In 1969, a man by the name of Whittaker, an ecologist, added to the heckle tree fungi, which he decided were important. And this gave us the five kingdoms tree, which most people learn about in their textbooks even today, of plants and fungi and animals and protists and monera. Now, there's another important implication of this model in terms of large-scale evolution. And this is the notion that life came to be. And then there occurred prokaryotes. These monera were called prokaryotes by a man by the name of Stanier, also in the 1960s. And somehow, these prokaryotes turned into eukaryotes. That's the model that all students learn. I will tell you that it is wrong. That will be the message from Carl Woese, which we still hear about later. Well, the view of Haeckel, the view of, of, of Whitaker, the view of Stanier, those were subjective views of life based on what people happened to believe. They were not objective views, experimentally determined views of life's diversity. That was only achieved with the development of so-called molecular phylogeny. That's using molecular sequences to determine relationships between organisms. Now, just a little bit about that. Molecular phylogeny sounds complex. It's actually very simple. You isolate genes from different organisms, and you determine the sequences of those genes. And then you very carefully line up those sequences so that homologous amino acids or nucleotides are juxtaposed. And uh, homologous means of common ancestry. So you line up these molecular sequences, 
and then you count the number of differences between pairs of sequences. You count the number of differences, and that's some measure of evolutionary distance. We're going to make a map. So that's a measure of evolutionary distance, number of sequence changes between the particular genes. And then you calculate a map of the relationships. They're usually called phylogenetic trees that most accurately fits all of the pairwise differences, all of the organism A to organism B, organism A to organism C, and so forth throughout the data set. And one can begin to infer maps. Now you can do this with any gene that you want, but if you want to relate all of life, you need a special gene, highly conserved and the ribosomal RNA molecules have been most, most useful for that. The ribosome is responsible for protein synthesis, it's present in all organisms, and, and the molecules are clearly homologous in all organisms. So this is Carl Woese. Carl Woese was not determining sequences. You could not determine sequences when Carl Woese started this work in the 1970s. What Carl Woese did was to isolate radioactive RNA, small subunit ribosomal RNA, and then hit it with, with nucleases, which break down the molecule into a lot of different fragments. And then one could isolate these into, here's, here's Carl Woese studying one of these so-called fingerprints, and then you can isolate these different so-called oligonucleotides and determine the individual sequences and compare, Woese couldn't compare sequences, he didn't have sequences, he only had these collections of oligonucleotides. But he could identify oligonucleotides that were homologous between the different molecules being studied and thereby draw a sense of relationship. And what Woes saw in his early studies, again, were not sequences. He had to extract, he had to extract uh, more complex information, so-called SAB values. But what you could see in his first studies was that here are examples of eukaryotes, here are examples of bacteria, and here were examples of an unusual recently discovered group, initially called Archaebacteria when it was thought that they were bacteria, and then the name in 1990 was changed to Archaea, because I, by then it was clear that this was a group of organisms related to one another and different, as different from the bacteria and the eukaryotes as either of those was from one another. Life was of three kinds, three domains, and by 1990, it was possible to make this more, more refined tree, an origin of life, a line, one line which spun out and became bacteria, another line which split off and then became on one hand archaea, on the other hand eukaryotes. That's the three domains view of life, and it became, it, it was on the table only by 1977, <coughs> clear only by 1990, much clearer now. Now, just a few words, a few points that I want to make in case I forgot. So, what this cartoon says, this is a cartoon of the three domain tree. It says that there are three main relatedness groups, eukarya, bacteria, archaea. We know that the origin is on the bacterial line out here, and this means that bacteria, or that eukaryotes and archaea are a sister group to the exclusion of bacteria. Now, I didn't show or didn't really talk about this yet, but the chloroplast and the mitochondria, the major organelles, are clearly of bacterial origin. But the eukaryotic nuclear line of descent is as old as archaea. And that is to say that the prokaryote-eukaryote model was wrong. That is to say that the prokaryotes, if you consider these both to be that, did not give rise, the prokaryotes did not give rise to eukaryotes. More on that coming. Most importantly for this presentation is the fact that sequences can be used to identify organisms. That's important because it meant that you didn't need to culture to identify organisms. All you had to do was to go to the environment and get genes or originally RNA molecules, determine sequences, use the phylogenetic reference as a map, and that will tell you what kind of organism is, it is with respect to all of other biology. That gave rise to metagenomics, the concept of if we go to this sample that I originally showed you, if we really want to find out what's in there and what's happening in there, what we would do is to go get a bit of that natural sample. We would make DNA and RNA from that sample. And there are multiple questions that you can ask. One important question of metagenomics is what kinds of organisms are these? 
What kinds? What, what is their identification with regard to other organisms? And that's a game that you can play. You do PCR, for example, to make ribosomal RNA genes, which you can then determine the sequences of, refer to the sequence databases, and this gives you some identification of the microbes, and you can now begin to construct the community structure and function. Another question would be, what kinds of genes are present in that environment? Well, that's a, another sequencing game. So you take the DNA and you determine and make a so-called metagenome library of every DNA that's in there, determine the sequences, look at the sequence databases, and this gives you some idea of the community genotype. And you can now begin to build up structure and function. And you can also analyze the RNA to tell you what genes are active. Now, some people will say that you're just collecting sequences, but I tell you that it's more than that because you can do things with the sequences. For example, you can make microarrays to do further examination, do qPCR, fluorescence in situ hybridization to figure out what they look like, and even use the sequences to track organisms into culture if you want to do that. That's metagenomics, but imagine, imagine back in 1981 when Carlos or near when Carlos first visited the lab. All we had was a natural sample, and you couldn't sequence DNA at that time. What to do? This is the beginnings of metagenomics. I'll tell you about a couple of early studies that put on the table metagenomics. Now, at that stage of the game, in the early 1980s, you couldn't sequence DNA. You could sequence very short RNA molecules. There is one ribosomal RNA molecule which is very short. It's called 5S ribosomal RNA. It's comprised of only 120 nucleotides in comparison to 1,500 nucleotides for the small subunit, 16S ribosomal RNA. So we took on, undertook studying two things. One we undertook to study were were, were symbiotic organisms associated with hydrothermal vent symbionts. These are so tube worms, so-called. I won't talk about the biology of that. The question is, it turns out that these organisms don't have these big tube worms, two meters long, don't have any mouth, gut, or anus. The way that they make a living is that from surrounding hydrothermal vent waters, they take hydrogen sulfide, CO2, and transport it to an inner tissue, which is densely colonized by bacteria. The bacteria would then oxidize the hydrogen sulfide, convert the CO2 into low molecular weight organic compounds, which are then used to feed the worm. The question arises, what kinds of bacteria are in this worm doing this symbiosis? The microbiologists had made many attempts to culture the Riftia symbiont, the two worm symbiont, and they were always unsuccessful. But this was a piece of cake for the molecular approach. You get a worm, you get the tissue where the bacteria are, you extract nucleic acids, and you can isolate 5S ribosomal RNA, which you can then label in vitro with P32, and then separate the eukaryotic and the bacterial type 5S ribosomal RNA, and then use the classic techniques to break it down and to determine the sequence. And that was kind of a boring answer. The, the symbiotic organism, the bacterium associated with the tube worm, turned out to be very similar in a phylogenetic analysis to E. coli. That's very boring, very boring, just another E. coli, close relatives. These are some of the people that were involved in this one in the lab, David Stahl, uh, well-known microbiologist now, Gary Olson, also well-known, Dave Lane. Anybody who's done ribosomal sequence work will know that name, Dave Lane from the Lane Mask. He died two years ago from, from, from ALS. The second thing that we undertook was to study a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, a hot spring at 91 degrees centigrade called Octopus Spring. We used the same trick with 5S ribosomal RNA, namely, uh, at this, again, pool is 91 degrees centigrade, but you can harvest filaments from the pool, and those we can prepare RNA from, do, do all of the usual sequencing approach. Carl Woese joined us on this first expedition to Yellowstone. He didn't think we would find anything new, but we did that. We found organisms in octopus spring that were as different from other bacteria as any other bacteria were from one another. As, aha, that's new. We need to keep doing this. So we kept doing that. 
Now one thing that had 5S ribosomal RNA is a very small molecule and not as useful for phylogeny as larger molecules such as the 16S ribosomal RNA. And there wasn't any database of anything at that time, so an early challenge to us was to develop a database of ribosomal RNA sequences. At the time we started this work, there, were there was only one 16S ribosomal RNA sequence. By the time that uh, we developed the techniques for doing rapid sequencing, there were only 20 sequences, and it was very hard to get those sequences. And what we developed was a series of, of these are just diagrams of small subunit ribosomal RNA of a bacterium, an archaeon, and a eukaryote. And we identified in the available sequences some sequences which are universally conserved, present in all known 16S ribosomal RNAs. And we synthesized. You could not buy them. You had to synthesize oligonucleotides manually at that time. And, and we used them initially for reverse transcriptase sequencing off of, directly off of RNA. And that worked real well. And uh, folks involved here were Mitch Sogan, my ex-wife, Bernadette Pace, who's a trapeze artist, and Dave Lane, once again, involved in this. Now, these same universal primers are still being used, not for sequencing necessarily, but for PCR. And as soon as P this was before PCR, but as soon as PCR was on the table, then it was clear that these primers were going to be of considerable use because we could use these universal primers to go into the environment and isolate all small subunit ribosomal RNA genes from an environment. And that worked out real well. Now the next thing was to go into isolating genes from the environment. And, uh, and that, for that, we used straightforward shotgun cloning that in the late 1980s by now, this was Tom Schmidt and Ed DeLong in the lab at that time, and we were studying marine picoplankton. This was the, at that time, it was thought that the oceans might even be all nearly sterile because of, you didn't culture very many things. But if you looked in the microscope, you could see that there was a lot there. So we went to the Sargasso Sea and to a site off Hawaii, collected 8,000 liters of water, concentrated it, prepared the picoplankton, made a library in phage lambda, used collections of ribosomal RNAs to pick out ribosomal RNA gene-containing clones, which were then sequenced. And we could begin to put together the makeup of the, of the marine picoplankton. This is where this SAR series came from. Those of you who know that, and the Aloha series of, of picoplankton. Now, we can now determine sequences, but you want to also find out, well, geez, what do they look like? What do they look like? We followed that with what we called phylogenetic stains at the time. We now would call them fish stains, fluorescence in situ hybridization. And the players here were Ed DeLong, here at a Halloween party, Gene Wickham, now at Purdue University, and Steve Giovanoni, now at Oregon State University. And the goal was to make a collection of oligonucleotides, which are fluorescently labeled, and are complementary to ribosomal RNA, not to the gene particularly, but to the ribosomal RNA. There are a lot of ribosomes in all cells, and so by binding the probes to ribosomes, by hybridizing cells directly to these probes, the probes would bind to the ribosomes. There are thousands of copies of ribosomes in each cell, so we could visualize in the, in the microscope uh, different kinds of organisms depending on the specificity of the particular fluorescent hybridization probe. So, we had gone full circle now. We'd gone into the environment, isolated DNA, determined sequences, made hybridization probes, showed you what the organism looked like in the environment. So metagenomics was on the table. And so expanding the tree, therefore, was, became a straightforward process. You get a sample, you make some DNA, you make a PCR library at this stage, and if you want long sequences, you would clone them and determine sequences, or you could take the sample, make DNA, make a PCR library, and then use one of a variety of, of rapid sequencing methods to determine sequences. And the tree has expanded very dramatically. We've studied many places around the world. We've studied hot springs and hydrothermal vents and hypersaline environments. We've studied organisms that live inside rocks. Every sunward, every, the sunward surface of every rock all over the planet is colonized to depths of millimeters to centimeters by microorganisms. Low concentration sometimes, not so low sometimes. We've studied organisms in caves and mines. We've studied organisms in the open ocean. We've studied human health and 
we're not heavily right now involved in studying the microbiology of the indoor environment, for example, in the New York City subway, or for example, in your shower curtain. If you scrape some of that soap scum off of your shower curtain and look at it in a microscope, you'll find that it's actually a biofilm. So we and many other people have studied a lot of organisms in a lot of places now, and the accumulation of ribosomal RNA sequences has been dramatic. This is just an accumulation of numbers with time. So by, in the, by the early 1990s, sequences begin to accumulate pretty rapidly. Now, this line, this is just total, ribosom total bacterial ribosomal RNA sequence accumulation. Here's total ribosomal RNA sequences. Here's ribosomal RNA sequences from cultured organisms. And so now this thing is way up here, and this is about the same. So by far and away, most of the microbial diversity that we know about is based on sequences, not on, not on characterization of organisms. And this has expanded the bacterial tree quite a bit. This is a cartoon of the bacterial phylogenetic tree. And each of these lines represents a radiation in its own right. And so in 1987, when Carl Woese wrote a very influential review, there were 12 known phyla of bacteria, divisions, if you will. This was up about threefold by 1997, and now we're up to about 100 main phyla. Only 30 of them have any cultured representation at all. Only seven, those that contain pathogens, have significant cultivation. And about 70 of the groups are currently uncultured, but I think they can be cultured. It's just a matter of time and knowing that they are there. Now it's turned out that the definitions of bacteria, any microorganism, have turned out to be more complex than we thought it was going to be. And this is because of a concept of what's become, being known as pangenome. And the concept here is that every time a new genome sequence is determined, even though that organism might be of the same species that you thought it was, 30% of the genes of that new organism will not be in the original representative of that species. And if you do 100 species of E. coli, for example, the number of genes is in the many tens of thousands, not the four or 5,000 that any particular E. coli contains. And we know that these genes are moving around fairly freely in the environment. And so think you can't think in terms of an environmental genome it's not just that environmental genome, it's all of the other genes which could exchange into that genome and are exchanging into that genome. The complexity is frightening. So if you look at one strain of E. coli, you some see a collection of genes, another strain, some genes which are not present here, some genes which are present, strain C, same thing. Unique genes, some which is shared with other E. coli strains. This is the pangenome. Now, if you ask what is the large-scale picture of biology, this is the picture that I would show you at this stage. And again, this is sort of a cartoon of a phylogenetic tree. This is what you see with ribosomal RNA. It's not necessarily what you see with other genes because of this issue of genes moving around. And what you see is that there are three main kinds of organisms, bacteria, about 100 main phyla, Eukaryotes, there are about three, 30 main groups, which we would call kingdoms for traditional reasons. And then there are archaea, there are two major and several minor sub, sub, several subgroups, they're not minor. And we know the origin is out here. Now this is what you see with ribosomal RNA. The picture with bacteria is pretty clear. There's a long blank line, and then boom, a radiation. We call that a polytomy, a star radiation. So this was all pre-cellular, then biology became sufficiently sophisticated to carry a cellular line of descent, and then diversification could occur. Similarly, archaea, long blank line, and then early diversification. Eukaryotes is a more complex story. By ribosomal RNA, everybody gets this story, namely one of these long blank lines, pre-cellular evolution, a basal radiation, one line of which radiated and one line of which radiated, giving the so-called crown group of fungi and animals and plants and stromatopiles and alveolates and coanoflagellates and a dozen or so other groupings. That's what you see with ribosomal RNA. Now, the people who do eukaryotic phylogeny, they like to do other sorts of, of uh, genes. 
and have come up with a rather more complex story, which I frankly don't have a lot of support for. And, and so namely, this is this, this multiple group, which uh, you might see with some concatenated ribosomal protein gene sequences, for example. And I won't develop that any further unless anybody's interested in discussing it further. I just want to make the point that there is not consensus, particularly in the eukaryotes, there is not consensus of what the eukaryote tree looks like. And frankly, I don't know what it looks like. There are a lot of problems. How do, what, I'm, I'm interested in the structure of the tree of life, the basal structure. And there are a lot of problems with working that out. It's not a simple phylogenetic solution for a couple of reasons. One is you have to have, to have a, a true tree, you have to have good representation of everything that should be in that tree. That is to say, you need representation. It's not good at this time. And there's also an intrinsic uncertainty. When you do tree calculations, the deeper you go into a tree, the more uncertain are the branch points. I'll show you what I mean. Representation. This is a big problem. I told you that there are about 100 bacterial phyla that we know of based on sequences. But yet, when you look at the sequence databases and ask the numbers of sequences that are present in these various of bacteria, this is the top 12, only the top 12. Proteobacteria, that's E. coli and colleagues, the most. Firmicutes, that's Bacillus, Clostridium, that group. Bacteroidetes, most of those sequences, bacteroid sequences, are from the human gut. And so forth. The important point here is of the 100 or so bacterial phyla, only about a dozen have any representation at all beyond collections of sequences from the environment. So it's impossible to make a truly resolved tree. You don't have the right sequences. Eukaryotes is just as bad. I told you there are about 30 kingdom level groups and lots of fungal sequences, lots of animal sequences, lots of plant sequences, lots of alveolate sequences, stromenopiles, but then you're out of the game in terms of being able to construct a true tree. And this is the big problem, in my opinion, with the phylogenetic tree of eukaryotes is that representation is poor. Now the other thing is this problem of you're always dealing in, in, in statistical calculations when you make a phylogenetic tree. And so the issue, the issue of, uh, of, of how you get sequences is problematic. And with, I won't elaborate on this, but the, the very large numbers of sequences that are now coming in are very short. So you may get a taxon call to the genus or something like that, but not very often. And there are real problems with dealing with next generation data, 454. For, uh, if you know that, MySeq, Illumina, these kinds of high volume sequencing methods. But as I point out here, it's getting better, and I don't want to de develop that anymore. The big thing, however, is the uncertainty. The deeper in a tree, the greater the uncertainty in branch points. Now, the reason for this is when you line up the sequences and count the number of differences, you're only seeing what you count. You're not seeing the unchanged, the, the changes that you did not see. That is to say, you might have an A next to a G, and you might know that it's an ancestral A, for example, but it wasn't necessarily a single A to G change. It might have been an A to C to T and then to a G. So there were two changes there you never saw. Also, there might have been, you might see two identical positions, but you don't know that they were always identical. That, so sequences that you now see identical in the past, an A, for example, might have gone to a G and then back to an A. So there was a chain, two changes you never saw. So there, there, that's in, that, that you can accommodate with a Poisson type calculation. So for example, if you look at the inferred sequence change, what you're going to accept as sequence change, an observed sequence change. So observed sequence change is such, such and such. By the time you get out here, deep in the tree, here is the unseen change that you can calculate using a Poisson distribution, but it's still a guess. It's still a prediction, not an observation. Here's what you observe. Here's what you infer. And with inference comes uncertainty. So the deeper you go into a tree, the deeper the, or the higher the uncertainty. And so here, if you're at the <coughs> species level, it doesn't make any difference. If you're at the phylum level, however, the base of the bacterial tree, well, 15 or so percent of your signal is inferred, uncertain. And if you're out at domain level, 30% of your signal is inferred. 
Anybody who tells you they have an analytical way of inferring the deepest radiations, uh-uh. And there are people out here who argue that there are other ways that the tree should be arranged. Well, how to make progress in resolving the phylogenetic tree? The answers are obvious. One thing you do is to get a lot more sequences. And you want long sequences because this is a st statistics game and you need more data. We do need better treeing algorithms for exploring deep phylogeny, although I think we're pretty good right now at that. And a big question, of course, is uh, how to go deeper than the last universal common ancestor, the base of the three domain tree. It is possible to do that. That's one of Carl Woese's white whales, I say. This is of Moby Dick fame. Now I need to finish off with a, a message directly from Carl Woese. Directly from Carl Woese. There's the message. This, this prokaryote that we all grew up with, loved, used in our language, see in our textbooks, there isn't any such thing. Yes, there's a taxonomic prokaryote, an organism which lacks a nuclear membrane, but taxonomy should be phylogeny. And a taxonomy based on prokaryote is not phylogeny, it's guesswork. I'll explain to you what I mean by this. And it's, this is about more than names. This is about the basic understanding of biological diversity. It's more than names. And the reason is that the fundamental issues in any science are simple. simple. They are two. One of, the, one of the themes, the fundamental issues, is order. In any science of those things that you would study, what is their organization? How are they organized? How are they related to one another? That's a fundamental question. The second fundamental question, how do, how do those things that you would study change? So for order, the chemist would worry about the periodic table. You don't scramble the periodic table and have a realistic view of chemistry. You don't do that. The biologist would worry about phylogenetic relationships. You must pay attention to the phylogeny. And change, how things evolve. That's the other thing that any science worries about. So the astronomer would worry about the Hertzsprung-Russell star series to understand how his star of interest is evolving. The biochemist would study biochemical mechanisms to understand how CO2 turns into us. <clears throat> and folks interested in the history of life would study the molecular tree of life. Order, change, those are the big things in any science. Now, there are two conceptual models of biological organization and evolution. Here's the typical textbook story still, namely that there was an origin, somehow prokaryotes came to be, and somehow those prokaryotes turned into eukaryotes. That's the prokaryote-eukaryote model. And then there's the three domain model. There was an origin, one lineage spun out of that, and this was not cellular life of the kind that we know in, that, in this period. One line spun out and became bacteria, this is the cartoon for bacterial radiation, and the other line spun out to give rise to, on one hand, eukaryotes, and on the other hand, archaea. So the big lesson from this experimentally determined phylogenetic tree, the big tree, is that the prokaryote-eukaryote model is just wrong for large-scale biological organization. Isn't that amazing? Where did it come from? If I tell you that it is bogus, I have to tell you where it came from. Here's where it came from, Ernst Haeckel, 1866, with his Monera, which then did other things. And then by the 1960s, one then had uh, uh, the Five Kingdoms tree. Now, the microbiologist never, ever, ever bought into that term Monera. I grew up in the, in, the, in the era just before prokaryote came onto the table in the middle 1960s. And no one talked about prokaryote, prokaryotes. And no one believed this concept of Monera until it was given the name prokaryote. And prokaryote means non-eukaryote, nothing more. That's not phylogeny, that's taxonomy. And not being something is not a scientifically valid concept or name. Let me prove or at least deal analytically with the model of prokaryote-eukaryote. It was introduced in the 1960s by Roger Stanier. Stanier blamed it on this guy Chaton, 1937. 
but Chaton's prokaryote wasn't the same as Stanier's prokaryote. So what prokaryote eukaryote bottle says that all eukaryotes are of a kind specifically related to one another. They're all following that wedge. All prokaryotes are of a kind related to one another to the exclusion of eukaryotes. So they're all of a kind and the prokaryotes gave rise to eukaryotes. That's the model. We can test that now because we have experimental data. And the experimental data is the three domains tree. This is the test, Woes, 1977 is when Woes first said there's no such thing as a prokaryote. So all eukaryotes are of a kind, picking up on the definitions of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All eukaryotes are of a kind, specifically related to one another. That's true. All eukaryotes would fall into this group. All prokaryotes are of a kind, related to one another to the exclusion of eukaryotes. That's false. There are two kinds of them there, are prokaryotes, one of which is more closely related to eukaryotes than is the other one. That's nothing. That's, that's, called a, that's, that's, not, that's not good, <laughs> not good phylogeny. And then finally, prokaryotes gave rise to eukaryotes. That's false, and that's really important, and that's one reason that I'm really bummed out by prokaryote eukaryote, because one consequence of this is that the eukaryote nuclear line, the organelles, the major organelles, the mitochondria, the chloroplasts are clearly of bacterial origin, but not the nucleus. The nuclear line of eukaryotes is distinct from both bacteria and archaea and is as old as archaea before cellular life. That line was established. Now, why am I doing this to you? It's a message from Carl Woese is one reason, but it does matter. Prokaryote, that term is scientifically unjustified. It was invented to fill a gap in knowledge. No one knew what that little stuff was. Since it's little, it must be the original stuff, right? That was the concept. No one knew. The name has false implication in deep evolutionary matters. It matters, in my opinion, that the eukaryote nuclear line is as old as life. That matters to me. And the textbooks tell you that it's two billion years old or something like that, and that's crap. The false understanding, you think you know what prokaryote is, and therefore you don't ask interesting questions. And there are many examples to do there. But here's the one that really makes me sad about prokaryote, eukaryote. It teaches our students false concepts at the most fundamental levels of biological organization and evolution. That's not good. So what else to call them? Well, an early thing to understand is that there isn't any them. Now, if one means the little stuff out there, which people commonly would call the prokaryotes. And that's more complex than that because there are a lot of little eukaryotes out there. I put weird, Danielle would probably say something about archaea as being weird. And if you're talking functional or evolutionary issues, you need to be more precise than prokaryote because if you look at basic information transfer machinery of archaea and eukaryotes, they're like one another, different from that of the bacteria, for example, and many other things. Now, you should not think that archaea are baby eukaryotes. They're not. They're really different. So, for example, uh, eukaryotes as bacteria, we make all of our membranes out of ester-linked lipids. Archaea don't do that. They use ether-linked lipids, and it's very different biochemistry. These are different creatures. But the important point is that in, 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 in language is, is concept. The concept is in the language, and so the language is the understanding, and so prokaryote, eukaryote model destroys your understanding of evolution. It's got to go. Thank you. <laughs> Carl Woese, the running dog of evolution. And uh, as an equity participant, I, I hope one day be able to show all my colleagues' achievements and my achievements together. It probably was a boiling time. So we have time. No, it, would all, it always seems boring. No boiling. I know. It always seems boring, though. Whenever you <laughs> walk along, oh, God, I've got to write another paper. You know, God, I've got to do a committee. You know. So it always seems crazy. But when you accumulate so some. We are in 
we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we have time for a lot of questions and discussion. Is anyone? Professor Svaldo? Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. There's been a recent paper that you're probably aware that came out a few weeks ago. Yeah, 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 Embley. Yeah. Well, what, um, can we write on this? Yes, sure. Sir. If you, if you should come to the lecture on Monday, I'm going to talk specifically right, about, okay, you'll, you'll, you will hear more. Is there a, is there a, No, Ooh, it is, Sharpies don't, Sharpies, the problem with Sharpies is you can't erase them, can you? Good idea. Actually, I can, I can verbally say it. So there's a, in the 1980s, a man by the name of James Lake proposed, he developed a new phylogenetic method that gave him a different answer than the three domains tree. More particularly, what, so there are two main groups of archaea. They're called Cranarchaeota and Uriarchaeota. What the method that James Lake developed did was to associate the eukaryotes specifically with the Crenarchaeota and the bacteria specifically with the, eukary with the uh, Uriarchaeota. Uh -huh, it's a different tree, different kind of tree. It says the eukaryotes are more related, closely related to one type of archaeon than the other. That's what his phylogenetic calculation said, and, it, and, and from many angles, people sh showed that that was wrong. Now, more recently, as Osvaldo points out, there's a man in, in, uh, by the name of Martin Embley and his colleagues that has resurrected this notion from James Lake. And James Lake, in this, in this model of his, which would associate the eukaryotes with the Crenarchaeota, he argued, therefore, that the Crenarchaeota gave rise to eukaryotes. And so he called, gave the, the Crenarchaeota a name. So here's the three domain tree. Here's the three domain tree. And in the James Lake tree, which he called the eocyte tree, there was an origin split going to the Crenarchaeota and the eukaryotes on one hand, and to the Uriarchaeota and the bacteria on the other hand. You see the difference? Well, that was a phylogenetic calculation, but it turns out that there aren't really any other data that are consistent with it. Now, uh, and, and the Lake model was shown analytically to be incorrect, the, the way the method works, what he called evolutionary parsimony. Anytime somebody invents a new method that gives you an answer that flies into the face of what you think you know, you should be careful because you don't quite know what happens in any computer algorithm. This man, Embley, as mentioned, published in a paper, Nature, a month or so ago, and why they did that, I don't know. But Martin Embley has developed another new method that resurrects this so-called eocyte tree. This eocyte is, eocyte is the name that Embley, or that James Lake and Embley subsequently picked up for the Crenarchaeota. It's a wonderful name, eocyte, dawn cell is what it means. Wonderful name. It just happens to not mean anything. Uh, so Martin Embley has resurrected this and using another new com fancy computer technique and doing some things to, with concatenated gene sequences that I don't like. But nonetheless, he gets this answer. And so now you say, OK, great. Let's say, is it true? And so now you have to do something else and begin to look for other qualifying properties. 
So for example, if you look at biochemical similarities, the Uriarchaeota and the Krenarchaeota are both archaea. They have many, many, many similarities. Most, Im or very importantly, is the biochemistry of membrane formation, es uh, ether-linked lip ether lipids for archaea, ester-linked lipids for eukaryotes, and for bacteria. Well, if, if, if this topology was correct, then ether-linked lipids had to be invented twice. And I think that's unlikely, which would be consistent with this model, namely a singular type of, of, of lipid formation. Uh, the Uriarchaeota and the bacteria have very different transcription machineries. So the bacteria, for example, in order to decide where the RNA polymerase is going to start reading DNA, the factor which is involved in this is called sigma factor. You all know about sigma factor required for transcription initiation. So bacteria use sigma factor, and Uriarchaeota use Tata binding proteins, just like we do, and just like Cranarchaeota, and just like eukaryotes, Tata binding protein. It does not make sense to have an independent development of the same mechanism that's associated with this group. It doesn't make sense. At any rate, when you begin to look at the other properties of the organism, just in using just what is the most parsimonious, eocyte doesn't get it. And there's more to say about that at the analytical level. So Embley invented a new method and got an old answer that had already proven wrong. <laughs> Don't know what to say except why did nature publish that? Now, I, I, will tell, I will mention to the students and anybody else who wants to come down to Dichado that I'm going to be talking more specifically about this whole issue of constructing phylogenetic trees, and we'll do a little exercise about that as well. Because this eocyte model is stupid, and I want to show you that. <laughs> What sequences, you say? You, you, you suggested more sequences. Yeah, more, more, more diversity of sequences. Yeah, more diversity of sequences. Yeah. But, but there's, been, there's been so much done, or so, much, so little done, as you well know, of studying eukaryotes in the environment. You know, so many of us have, have uh, gone out into the environment and, and done lots of bacterial stuff, for example, but relatively few people, Danielle, for example, Carlos has done some of this, very few people have done very much in terms of surveying eukaryotes that are out there. One problem in terms of the technology that we use is that the eukaryote nuclear line of descent tends to be rather long branch lengths in, in phylogenetic trees, and that creates problems, it turns out. Among these problems are that you lose the universal sequences that we could use to harvest all bacterial ribosomal RNA, most bacterial ribosomal RNA genes. So universal primers is a real problem, getting unusual eukaryotes out of the environment. And the second thing is that there aren't many of them. Uh, uh, wherever you go, if you take a handful of biomass and do ribosomal RNA sequences, uh, 90 to 99 percent of what you see will be bacterial. One to 10 percent will be archaeal, and one percent or less will be eukaryotic. In fact, if you go into the environment typically, the, the signal for a eukaryote tends to be chloroplast or mitochondrial sequences because there are a lot more chloroplasts in a typical eukaryote than the eukaryote nucleus. So, uh, you know, all of, the, all of these things together, more diverse eukaryote sequences are required, I argue. So, what I was going to ask about actually the bacterial side, um, so we've done a lot of work with bacterial diversity in screening. Are there parts of the bacterial tree which are sort of equally concerning? Well, I think an early question would be, are we there? Have we, have we, you know, certainly we've not saturated the bacterial, the, bac the number of bacterial phyla. We're not saturated. But it's really been tailing off for the past decade. And so I think we're, you know, we're pretty much getting there in terms of describing the broad diversity. But for 70, of 100, 70 out of those 100 or so phyla, we have, you know, 
maybe a few dozen or a few hundred sequences only, and they tend to be short sequences that are available. So more thorough exploration of the sequence diversity within diverse bacteria, or within the environment, better yet. There's a wonderful thing being done now at the Joint Genome Institute in, in Walnut Creek in California with the Department of Energy. And it's being done a few other places too, the concept of going into the environment, going into different environments, and picking up individual cells and amplifying the genomic DNA from those individual cells, first determining a ribosomal RNA sequence to see whether you're interested in it further, and if you're interested in it further, then doing a genome sequence. And there's a lot, of, that's quite a bit of that. They just published 209 genomes, something like that, partial genomes. And that's clearly one direction to go. And equally important to the sequences to compare, in my opinion, is the other correlative information, biochemistry, the sorts of things that you would correlate with, with evolutionary relationships. So this doesn't bring a need to have more also organism that we can cultivate, that we can combine now what we know and that would be a good that would that would be a good thing to do. That would be a good thing to do. Uh, I argue that that culturing is you know, I like culturing microbes, but in terms of going and doing something new, that's probably not the first thing that you do. The first thing that you do would be to, if you're studying a particular environment, you see a sequence, you determine, determine who's there. So that's a sequence business. And so now you can say, aha, I want to know more about this particular organism. Now you have a ribosomal RNA sequence, so you can use that ribosomal RNA sequence to make a fish probe, a fluorescent probe, to identify that sequence, and now use that to track the organism into culture. So for example, if you want to culture that, then it's never easy to culture. It, people think it will be, but you will know that it's not. <laughs> well, you know, it's tradition, and, and I'll tell you an anecdote, uh, Tom Schmidt. Mm -hmm. well-known environmental microbiologist was asked to participate in the most recent edition of Brock. He refused because of the prokaryote thing. If the best of the texts that I know that dump prokaryote is the Slonczewski text, Slonczewski and Foster. They use it only in a brief description of historical relevance, and they dropped it. So it'll happen. I mean, the truth is there. So you must have had arguments with the authors of the Brock book. I know Mike Madigan very well. And Mike argues that if he drops prokaryote, that people won't buy his textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and he, he made me truth in that. I don't know. It's, it's, it, but what's remarkable, and you lived through the pre-prokaryote days, no one believed that monora crap. And prokaryote was never more than ch name change from monora. But it sounded scientific. It made you think you knew something about evolution just didn't happen to be right. Professor Carlos? Yeah. Carlos. Some people claim that since nitrogen transfer is so pervasive and so on, that any tree of life uh, it cannot be linear. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well. yeah. Well, I think that all genes are not the same. I think that some genes are moving around between different organisms. There's no question. And you would not use those genes to, de to de determine a phylogeny of organisms. Other genes do not travel. Ribosomal RNA genes are not known to transfer. Transfer RNAs you can transfer, but it doesn't happen very often. tRNA synthases sometimes transfer, but not very often and only locally in the tree. The issue is of whether a gene will transfer to another organism is how many, I think, how many other elements of the cell does that particular gene talk to. So if a gene talks to a lot of other cellular, cellular elements in, in a specific way, the probability that it will transfer into another environment where it has to also carry out these many specific interactions, that probability of transfer is low. And so the probability of transfer from one organism to another organism goes down with the phylogenetic distance between the organisms. But, but again, some genes just don't transfer. 
About 20% of the genes in, 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 in E. coli are not known to transfer. These would include the ribosomal RNA genes, the RNA polymerases, the DNA polymerases, for example. And those, I do believe, that one can use to outline a cellular line of descent. A cellular line of descent. Now, a cellular line of descent is not necessarily the entire organism. It's just the genetic line. So, some, some genes can be used to define the cellular line of descent, others, whatever. The important point is that you cannot do a universe, trying to do a tree with full genome sequences for that reason is not a useful thing to try to do, simply because of the lateral transfer. That, that indeed would confuse the calculation, trying to do genome trees, which is why I don't try to do them. In principle, it could be, but there's another big problem in the, in the relative rates of change of different genes. So if you have RNA polymerase, for example, the conservation of, RNA, conservation of ribosomal RNA across all of life is about 50%, 50% sequence identity across all of life. RNA polymerase across all of all life is maybe 5% sequence identity, something like that. Now, sequence similarities, to be sure. Within the archaea, the sequence similarity uh, sequence identity of, of RNA polymerases, for example, is probably 25%, something like that. The important point is that when you start mixing in genes which have different rates of change, you're now back into this problem that I mentioned of the deeper you go into a tree, the greater the number of changes there are, the more uncertain the answer. So what you're doing in concatenating a lot of genes of different kinds that have different rates of change you're pasting uncertainty on uncertainty on uncertainty on uncertainty. And even though some of the genes might be fairly good, like say ribosomal RNA, these other genes that one would want to paint in there would confuse the picture because of the uncertainty in the, in the, in the calculations. That's an easy answer. Okay. You see the point, though? Because that, that uncertainty is something that people don't pay enough attention to. The deeper you go into a tree, the greater the amount of change the more uncertain the answer because of all the unseen change. Dr. Thanks, thanks very much again.